Welcome to part two of Thriving Medical Missionary Families. My name is Lillian Balbeck. I'm the Secretary of the General Conference Medical Missionary Department. I also work as a registered dietitian and a lifestyle medicine professional. It is my greatest joy to share the health message in Jesus with everyone I meet and to help people change their poor lifestyle habits for good. Imagine life 10 years ago. You'd be driving home from work and you'd see children and teens playing in their yard, riding their bikes, playing hide-and-go-seek or jumping rope. On the weekends, you'd see families doing yard work together. Today, there aren't any children playing in my neighborhood and probably not in yours either. Why? One big reason is they're inside the house on their smartphones, computers and video games. A 2019 survey by Assurian found that on average, Americans check their phones 96 times a day. That's once every 10 minutes. Children ages 8 to 12 spend 4 to 6 hours watching and using screens, television, smartphones, tablets, gaming consoles, and computers. Teens spend up to 9 hours per day and during the epidemic, some of them spent up to 13 hours per day. What are the effects of so much screen time on our children's health? Research shows there is loneliness, obesity, poor quality of life, unhealthy diet, attention deficit symptoms, reduced emotional and social intelligence, decreased physical and cognitive abilities. A 2018 study showed that increasing screen time to more than one hour per day was linked to lower psychological well-being. High screen users were significantly more likely to be diagnosed with anxiety or depression. What else is the problem with spending excessive time on screens? The first research study is on iPhone distraction. Researchers asked participants to take a series of tests that measured their cognitive capacity. Participants were told to put their phones in airplane mode. Then they randomly asked them to place their phones on the desk, in their pocket or in another room. The results showed those who left their phones in another room did significantly better on the test than those with their phones physically closed during the test. Dr. Ward writes, the integration of smartphones into daily life appears to cause a brain drain that can diminish vital mental skills such as learning, logical reasoning, abstract thought, problem solving, and creativity. Notice, the mere presence of smartphone diminishes our intelligence. Are you giving yourself a brain drain? But that is not all. Smartphones also cause eye anxiety. In this study, 163 college students were divided into two groups. One group was asked to turn off their phones and store them under the seat. The other group had their phones taken away to be returned later. Three times during the 30-minute session, students completed a test measuring anxiety. The results showed both groups had equally increased anxiety, but the heaviest phone users had increased anxiety after just 10 minutes of not being able to use their phone. And their anxiety steadily increased over the hour. In a third study, researchers looked how smartphones affected learning in a lecture with 160 students at the University of Arkansas at Monticello. They found that students who didn't bring their iPhones to class scored a whole letter grade higher on a test than those who brought their phones. So young people, if you would like to improve your grades, don't bring your smartphone to school. Would you like to know who are the happiest teens? In a long-term study, researchers at the University of San Diego and the University of Georgia examined data on over 1 million 8 to 12th graders. They found that teens who spend more time with friends in person and less time texting or video chatting were happier than those who spent more time 
in front of their screens. Notice, they were happier because they spent more time with friends face to face. They had increased life satisfaction. They participated more in extracurricular activities. They read books and publications in print more frequently. This study found that the happiest teens are those who use digital media less than one hour per day. Parents, are you overseeing how much time your children and teens are spending watching screens? How much time are we as parents spending with screens? Most smartphones keep track of that and we can check for ourselves. What are the recommendations for screen time? For children less than two years old, it's zero time. Children two to five years old, it's one hour per day. Five to 17 year olds, two hours per day. And for happy teens, it's one hour or less per day. What does the Bible say about time spent on screens? In 1 Corinthians 9.25 we read, every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. So a man who is running the race of life is temperate in all things. What does that mean? Temperance in all things of this life is to be taught and practiced. Temperance in eating, drinking, sleeping, dressing, and working, as well as screen time, is one of the grand principles of the religious life. How does temperance relate to our salvation? Temperance alone is the foundation of all the graces that come from God, the foundation of all victories to be gained. Did you hear that? When we are temperate, we lay the foundation for victory in every other area of our lives, at school, at work, in our relationships, in our character development. Let's look at some practical strategies how we can limit our screen time. First, stop using screens during mealtimes. Second, give up screens when you're talking to family and friends or any person for that. Three, stop looking at screens at least one hour before bedtime, ideally three, according to research. And four, remove screens from your bedrooms. Just think of all the good things we can do with this extra time when we cut our screen time. Quality time with Jesus Christ, Bible study, good times with family and friends, and times to share the gospel with others. Do you know which monarch practiced self-control with the use of his time? He lived in a poor home and faithfully and cheerfully helped with household duties. He learned a trade and worked with his own hands. He was not an ordinary king, but the commander of heaven, the king of the universe, Jesus Christ, the son of God. Angels had delighted to do his will, but while he lived on earth, he was a loving, obedient son. In his earth life, Christ was obedient and helpful in the home. He learned the carpenter's trade and worked with his own hands in the little shop at Nazareth. The Bible says of Jesus, and the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. As Jesus worked in his home, and in the carpenter shop, as he talked with his heavenly father and spent time in nature, he increased in wisdom, he grew physically and became spiritually strong. This is his recipe for success for our youth and adults. Parents, do your children help in the home and yard with daily work and duties? Children, are you helping your mom and dad with household duties? as Jesus did? Why is that important? Manual labor strengthens the prefrontal cortex of our brain, the executive function of our brain, the seat of the will and spirituality. Here's where planning, decision-making, problem-solving, and creativity take place. 
This is why Jesus increased in wisdom and spirituality. What type of practical work should our children and youth do? God desires parents and teachers to train children in practical duties of everyday life, encourage industry. Girls and boys who don't have outdoor works should learn how to help mother. From childhood, boys and girls should be taught to bear heavier and still heavier burdens. Intelligently helping in the work of the family firm, mothers patiently show your children how to work with their hands. Are you wondering why boys as well as girls need to help inside the home? Since both men and women have a part in homemaking, boys as well as girls should gain a knowledge of household duties, such as make a bed, to put a room in order, to wash dishes, prepare a meal, wash and repair their own clothing. This is the training that um, will not make a boy less manly, it will make him happier and more useful. And what about girls? They could learn to harness and a horse and drive a horse, to use a saw and hammer as well as the rake and the hoe. They would be better fitted to meet life emergencies. Of course, girls today don't harness a horse. They learn to drive, they can learn to change a tire and to use a saw and hammer Children who are eight years old can be taught to wash their laundry and iron their clothes. I remember those days with our sons. It was a big help to them and to us. Did you know that cooking, for example, is an activity that utilizes multiple areas of your brain and all your senses? It requires hand-eye coordination, concentration, multitasking, planning, and a working memory to execute a recipe correctly. As such, it's a great exercise to improve brain function. Children and youth, what is your attitude when you must wash dishes or clean bathrooms? Inspiration says each child in the family should have a part of the home burden to bear and should be taught to perform his task faithfully and cheerfully Faithfully meaning good quality work with a happy attitude. To make sure the work is fairly distributed, we had a chore chart on the fridge of, in our kitchen. The time and day for each chore was written under the child's name. At the end of the week, we had a reward store where they could redeem little gifts for their diligent work. Dr. Nedley states, Brain development of children from the Western world is becoming threatened by their failure to work with their hands at school and home. Certain classes such as woodworking, metalwork, crafts, agriculture, home economics, auto mechanics are becoming less popular in school and many schools don't even offer them due to lack of interest. Working with one's hands in a real 3D environment is crucial for the full cognitive and intellectual development of youth, according to Dr. Arig Sigmund. He states the Western world is fast becoming a software instead of a screwdriver society. His report showed that many 11-year-olds have deficits in certain areas of their cognitive development that were not present in children of the same age one or two generations ago. Here are some practical ideas what children can do with their hands. Look at this chart, cleaning the house, the garage, cooking together, doing yard work, music lessons, playing and singing together, having family game night. Once a week, something fun with your children. It's not only work, but it's also fun times learning how to change a tire, learning to change the oil, doing simple house repairs, having hobbies, sewing, photography, knitting, woodworking, ceramics. What about doing good to others, visiting the sick and the elderly, lending a helping hand, writing a card by postal mail, and spending one hour or more on those activities per day will boost your frontal lobe circulation. Children and youth, 
tell your mom to sit down in a lounge chair, then ask her to tell you what she needs to have done first, then go and do it cheerfully. Keep at the job until you have completed it well. Then watch her smiles and hear her words of thankfulness. Do gardening as a family. This is one of the best exercises because it helps our cardiovascular system, reduces stress, depression, and anxiety. Did you know that getting dirt under our nails while digging in the ground can also make us happy? As we inhale Macrobacterium vacae, a healthy bacterium in the soil, our serotonin levels increase and reduce anxiety. By eating vegetables from our garden, we also inhale this Macrobacterium. What are the other benefits of gardening? Inspiration says the constant contact with the mystery of life and the loveliness of nature, as well as the tenderness called forth in ministering to these beautiful objects of God's creation, tends to quicken the mind and refine and elevate the character. And the lessons taught prepare the worker to deal more successfully with other minds. Did you hear that? Gardening will sharpen our mind and morally improve our character. It will help us to be more successful with our interpersonal relationships? Wow, these are rewards that only God can give. Parents, I believe you want to obey God's health laws and teach them to your children, but you may often fail. Children and youth, how many times have you said, I want to spend less time on social media and failed? Would you like to know how to change any bad habits for good? The secret of lasting habit change is not a pill, it's not a behavior change program, although these may help. The secret to lasting change is the man, Jesus Christ. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. How slow we are to believe these words of Jesus. Without me, you can do nothing. The problem is you and I want to do something on our own. You wake up every morning, you eat breakfast and go to work. You bring home a paycheck and pay your bills. You have a beautiful family and go to church. You're a pretty good person and wish the rest of the world would just settle down. The truth is, Awakening this morning is a gift from Jesus. The food you eat today is a gift from Jesus. Your job and paycheck are a gift from Jesus. Your family is a gift from Jesus. Everything you have, everything you are, and everything you do is a gift from Jesus. Until you recognize that, you will not have lasting victory. Christ wants to give us the power to overcome every intemperate habit permanently. All we have to do is surrender. Do this the first thing every morning when you awake. Pray this prayer. Take me, O Lord, as holy thine. I lay all my plans at thy feet. Use me today in thy service. Abide with me and let all my work be wrought in thee. So. Day by day, you may be giving your life into the hands of God and consequently your life will be molded more and more after the life of Christ. Imagine the future of your family with Jesus by your side. You begin your day with personal devotions. You have a regular schedule for meals, work, sleep, and family worship. You clean out your cupboards and fridge from junk food and fill them with healthy food. You begin to teach your children to cook simple, healthy meals. And then life gets more wonderful when you reduce screen time. You feel more relaxed because your children are helping with housework and yard work. Everyone is feeling better and sleeping better because health laws are being followed in your home. But wait, while your family is flourishing and practicing God's laws, most of the people in your neighborhood, at your work, and in the world are ignorant of his laws. They have little self-control, and as a result, they are unable to appreciate eternal truths. They say, 
this tastes good, so I must eat it. This feels good, so I must do it. This looks good, so I must have it. This is how many parents are leading their children in the path of self-indulgence and preparing the way for them to suffer disease and an early death. What are you and I doing to share the health message with them? What are we doing to share Jesus with them? You and I are the hands and the feet of Jesus sent to a sick and hopeless world. As a thriving medical missionary person and family, you and I must share the health message and the joy of knowing Jesus with others. How do you do that? By making your home a hospitality center. Here are 10 simple strategies that really work. I'm sure you'll come up with others. First, when you make bread or cookies, make a few extra ones and share them with your neighbors and co-workers. When we were homeschooling, our sons had a small bread baking business. They milled whole wheat flour and made six to 10 loaves a week to share. My husband was also selling them with his co-workers in the cities where he worked as a transportation manager engineer. This was a great witnessing tool. Number two, in the summer, you can share your fresh produce from the garden with neighbors, co-workers, and everyone you like. Number three, you can have a small cooking class in your home and invite your neighbors. I have done that. It was well received. I shared Ministry of Healing and other health literature. Number four, you can invite people to your home for the opening of the Sabbath and a light supper. A few times my husband invited co-workers and their spouses to our home for Sabbath opening. We sang hymns together, read a few verses from the Bible, and had a light supper together. Do you know whom the employees in the city of Fontana would turn to when they had a question on health? To Paul Balbach. Where would they go when they needed encouragement for their problems? To Paul Balbach's office for prayer. Some of the top officials in that city as well as co-workers, had a copy of the Great Controversy of Desire of Ages in their office. This is what a thriving medical missionary does. Number six, when one of the co-workers of my husband's job got cancer, she called me for help. Why? Because she was at our house for Friday evening for fellowship. She asked me to make her vegetarian burgers. I brought her plant-based dishes. I brought her freshly squeezed juices and taught her daughter to make juice for her. But most importantly, I brought her Jesus love and told her about the great physician who loves her and who took her case into his hands. I sang to her and prayed with her. This is medical missionary work in the truest sense. Number seven, on Sabbath, invite visitors from church to your home, lonely people, seniors. Make your meals simple and let everyone in your family help with cooking and cleaning. This is how your home can become a thriving hospitality center. Number eight, every morning you can pray, Lord, help me to meet someone who needs your love today. When I do that, the Lord sends me a co-worker. He sends me to my patients, to my neighbors, or to the gym. The other day I was at the gym and a woman said, thank you for giving me the Life Source magazine. I, can, I had given her the magazine two weeks ago and she said, I see you quote the Bible in there. Are you a Christian? I said, yes, I am. She hugged me and said, I'm a Christian too. I was a Muslim before. I can't wait to come to your health classes. Here's my address. Please send me the flyer. This is how God makes divine appointments for us. Pray with people. When my friends, co-workers come to me with a problem, I listen and show empathy. Then I ask them, would you like me to pray with you? They say, sure. After prayer, their face lights up and they have peace. No one has ever refused a prayer. Number 10, 
Now that you and your family are following God's health laws and sharing them with others, you may consider having community health classes in your church. 11 years ago, we started holding health lectures for the community in Roanoke Church. Once a month, we begin with a health talk and then demonstrate one or two plant-based recipes. Our young people assist with registration, food demonstration, and their smiles. The response from our guests has been great. Now some of them want Bible studies, others are attending church. These are 10 simple ways that we have used to share the health message and open doors for the gospel. You won't use all of these methods at once, but as God gives you strength and grace. Are you ready to thrive with God? Are you ready to take excellent care of your body as you've never done before? Are you willing to teach your children God's laws of health? Are you ready to share the health message with your neighbors and co-workers and others so you all can experience the abundant life on this earth and eternally with Jesus Christ? Are you shy? Are you fearful? God says to you today, Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth and I will teach thee what thou shalt say. Exodus 4.12 I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Hear my Lord, send me. Isaiah 6.8